well. <laughs> this microphone is like, good morning, IBC. Just before we get started, I know a lot of people are asking me that it's raining out there and is there, is there going to be a photo shoot today? Yes, there will be. And um, our photographer, Jonathan Creately, is not feeling well today. But praise the Lord, Guy Hassler, his, um, his sort of family member, <laughs> is covering for him. So we do have a photographer, praise the Lord. And we are doing the photo shoot inside the church if it's raining. So just wait for our announcement. Um, Ate Gigi Aquino will be emceeing later on. So she will let you guys know what is happening before the photo shoot. So to God be the glory, I just wanna bring all the praises to Him because we know that we can really trust Him and He is in control. So let us all stand up and just bring our praises to Him. Your prom 
morning, everyone. How are you today? Good to see you. Glad you're here on this beautiful, beautiful Sunday. It is a beautiful Sunday. Every Sunday is a beautiful Sunday. Well, this morning it's already been an exciting time. We had two people baptized this morning, Elma and Yue, as they trusted the Lord earlier in the year and today followed through with believers' baptism. So congratulations to them and pray for them as well. This morning I'm going to be reading from the book of the Revelation. The book of the Revelation, chapter 1, verse 4, 5, 6. Uh, yeah, 4, 5, and 6. Revelation 1, verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. And the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And has made us kings and priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Aren't those wonderful words? Wonderful words from our Lord, about our Lord, expressing the heart of every believer as we look forward to his return someday. For he is our king and he's in control of all things. Let's go to him in prayer, praying that he would have his way in our hearts, our lives this morning through the message, through the singing, through all that's to be done, that we would be surrendering ourselves completely to him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, as we come to you this morning, may we stop and pause in our hearts and in our mind, taking away everything that's from this world and in this world and just pushing it aside as we think about you, as we think about the love that you have for us, Jesus Christ, the one and only Son of God, who gave his life as a sacrifice to us. For though he was crucified, he lives. And because he lives, Lord, our life is full. For we who have trusted him by faith, we live and will be forevermore with him. Thank you for the promises of your word. Thank you for the comfort and the strength and the security that we have in the Lord himself. I pray this morning that your that our time here together with you would be a time of blessing, a time of rejoicing, a time of celebrating, but a time of praising you. For worthy are you, the one who takes away the sins of the world. For we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And God bless you. Let's stand together once again and just focus on trusting the Lord not thinking about anything else but God alone, Waymaker.
Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, team. If we could please have our ushers begin to be making their way forward at this time, and we'll continue our time of worship in our offering time. As they come, I want to highlight one of our missionary family, and that is Cliff and Shannon Wadsworth. We've supported them uh, with the church plant of Cornerstone Baptist Church. And so we need to continue to uplift Cornerstone Baptist, Cliff and Shannon, pray for God's provision, and pray that God would bless them uh, with the faithfulness that they have to the gospel. And I know they love the Lord, they love the gospel, and they are winning people in South Auckland to Jesus Christ. So we need to continue to pray for them. Let us praise the Lord for uh, the offering of last week. Uh, $9,957, of which uh, healthy two hundred or 2,451 2, was for missions specifically. That's a good missions offering, praise the Lord, and 80 for children's ministry. So we thank the Lord for the faithfulness of God's people. And I want to urge you and encourage you to continue to be faithful to the Lord. Be faithful to pray for our missionaries. Uh, go to the missions wall. Uh, we put our letters up there all the time. And if you read them, you'll better be able to know what's happening with them and how you might be able to pray specifically for them. So praise the Lord. Continue to uh, remember our missions commitments. In August, we uh, took our missions pledges. It was a difficult time, if you recall, uh, to do our pledges. But I believe many of you either did your pledges online, like we, uh, many of us, or uh, you pledged, you knew in your heart what God wants you to give. Be faithful to the Lord in that. Let's go ahead and uh, ask the Lord's blessing on this uh, week's offering and also on the ministry of Cliff and Shannon Wadsworth. Lord, thank you for uh, your goodness to us as we gather together freely. And sing our songs of praises to you, our God. You are our God. Amazing love. And Lord, it is amazing. And may it be afresh in our hearts and our minds how amazing your grace is, your love towards us is. Lord, I pray that you are glorified. Thank you for the offering of the past week. We pray for all of our missionaries. In particular, we lift up Shannon and Cliff Wadsworth. We pray that you would provide for all their needs and that... Lord, you would bless their faithfulness to you, to the word, to the gospel, that you would provide more souls to be saved, and that they would disciple them into strong believers. We thank you, Lord, for calling them to that ministry. Thank you in Jesus' name. And we say...
choir. It's not really bells. It's chime choir. We appreciate that rendition of shine, Jesus, shine. It makes me want to sing with you. Good to be in God's house, amen. It's good to also have my daughter here with us, Gretchen. Gretchen. Gretchen's in the back, already helping Harry out. So great to have Gretchen home. It's good to have the family together. Um, this coming week's an important week for us. Uh, Charlie and Tara getting married and uh, on Saturday, so congratulations to them. going to be a great week, a busy week. Um, our text this morning is going to be from 1 Corinthians 11. going to start in verse number 2. 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 2. Um, uh, it's not actually in the notes. I don't know if it's too late to get the words up to read overhead. Uh, I was going to read through the whole thing of uh, chapter uh, 11, verse 2 to 16. If you have your Bibles, follow along. Uh, I'm kind of throwing our media team a curveball a little bit. Uh, but I, I just want to read through the whole passage, and then we'll uh, get into the message part. Verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. Judge among yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Let's pray. Lord, we need you today. Lord, would you open our hearts and our Minds and give us illumination from the Holy Spirit to understand more of your word and how you would have us to function and live in this world as we walk with you in it. Lord, I pray again for any soul who is uncertain of their relationship with you. And I pray, Lord, through the testimony and song that we've had and through the lives of your people through the preaching of the word, I pray, Lord, that you would begin a work in that person's heart and drawing them to the one who loves them, who created them, who died for them. And may they come to faith in Jesus Christ. We ask all these things, move in, move in this place today, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen? Okay. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to lie to you. I come to this passage, and I approach it with fear and trembling, and uh, I thought maybe I should have Brother Jim Herzl come and preach on this one for me this week. Uh, uh, I didn't do that. Uh, I asked Pastor Mike. He said, no way. You're on your own. Um, <laughs> so uh, here we are, but uh, I, you know, my desire is to preach the Word. 
um, and let the word of God speak to us. And if there are times when it goes against our thinking or our culture, then, it, then so be it. it. It must. And I'm also uh, aware that, uh, you know, many uh, theologians and pastors have discussed this and, and talked about this. And, and there's been uh, many that try to understand it better and tackle it. And it's a difficult, it's a difficult one. To fully ascertain every aspect of it. It's, it's, not, it's not easy. But we do know some things. For some time there has been a big push in our culture. When I say our culture, I'm talking specifically Western civilization. A big push that seeks to eliminate differences between men and women. And that's a shame. That's why this message is called Celebrate the Difference. And the difference is referring to is what God has created, men and women. There's been a push for gender confusion. When I was growing up, I was basically taught there's two genders in this world. You got your male gender. <clears throat> you got your female. And now there seems to be many more categories that are being added all the time. Currently, from what I can ascertain <clears throat> there's some 112 genders available to people 112 we went from two to 112 i was reading through this list of 112 genders to see what is available that you can identify your gender as and here's a few of them there's one called this is just a, a handful a sampling of some of the genders one is called the amica gender amica gender this gender changes depending on which friend you happen to be with. So if you're with, you know, this person today, you're this gender. If you're with this person, you are a different gender. There's one called the Apkonsu gender. I'm not making this stuff up, okay? Uh, ap I might be mispronouncing it, but I'm not making it up. Apkonsu gender. This is a gender where you don't know what your gender is, or no, no, you know what your gender is not, but you don't know what it is. It, this gender is hiding itself from you, okay? So you know what you're not, but you're really not sure what you are. There's a gender called the, a gender blank, a gender that can only be de described as a blank space. Don't know. There's one called heliogender. This is a gender that is warm and burning. I don't know what that means, but it's a gender. It's warm and, and burning. There's one called varin, varin gender. This is a gender that seems to shift the moment that it is identified. As soon as you have it identified, then it shifts to something else. You can never pin that one down. How would you like to be that, barren gender? There, like I said, there's so many more. And then we wonder why there's so much confusion with people these days in these regards. I believe as Christians, instead of trying to say there is no difference, instead of denying there is a difference, we should be celebrating the differences that God has made. God made man, God made woman. Both he made in his image. He said it was very good. He designed it, and it was good. And we need to, we need to uplift, uphold his design as intended and say, yes, God, thank you. For the differences that we have in the genders of the male and the female. He designed it for a reason. He designed them on purpose. In this chapter, in chapter 11, uh, uh, Paul, at the latter part, addresses an issue regarding the Lord's Supper. Which we're going to look at next week. When we have Lord's Supper also next week. So it's a perfect time to be addressing this issue of the Lord's Supper. But here he begins with issues regarding the uniqueness and differences of these genders that God made. And that's going to be our focus today, is understanding 
the uniqueness of what God has made. The first point I want us to notice, though, is that God's word does not change. Verse number two, Paul writes to him, says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the, what's the word? Traditions. Anybody ever seen Fiddler on the Roof? Yeah, okay, some of us. Uh, there's a song at the beginning called Traditions. Okay, I'm making a fool of myself, but if you've seen it, you would know what I'm talking about. Uh, the father is struggling because he wants to hold to the traditions uh, of the Jewish culture. They were Jews in, in uh, Germany at the time. It was a difficult time for them. He says, though, uh, keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But the word here, traditions, is not what you may think. It's not just keep traditions, okay? Uh, in our house, ever since, you know, we, we've been married, we acknowledge as a tradition in our home uh, Thanksgiving Day. This past week was Thanksgiving. It's an American Thanksgiving. Uh, but we also maintain it here. And we get together, we got together with the Santosos and the Herzls, and we have, have a group together. Pastor Mike and Gina and, and the family also do similar things. This is tradition. And we give thanks to the Lord, and we eat a wonderful meal together. And um, that's tradition. That's not what this is referring to, though. It refers to the accepted word that they had already received. It's the accepted word, the word of God that they had received that Paul is referring to. He uses similar words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, where he says, Therefore, brethren, he's speaking to the Thessalonica church. He says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. So he's telling the Thessalonians, stand fast, hold those traditions, the ones that you were taught by us, the apostles, either by us directly as we were speaking to you with the authority that comes from God as apostles of Jesus Christ, or by the written word of God that you have in your hands. Hold to those traditions. These are the traditions that Paul refers to when he says, keep them. That is the teachings, the doctrines, the truth the unchanging truth of the word of God. These are traditions that we all need to keep in our own homes, in our hearts, the traditions of God's word. With this in mind, he uh, then addresses some things. Paul brings up some issues. And the first one here is that God is the founder of headship. Headship. That is to do with being the head. Authority. Authority. God is the founder of this thing that we call authority. Verse 3, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is, thank you, Bong. And the head of Christ is God. Okay, this is headship. And Paul brings out three particular aspects, examples of headship. And he sets a foundation for the teaching of the rest of the chapter when he lays out God's plan for headship. He makes clear that God is the one who established principles of order, principles of authority, principles of accountability. The head of every believer. Oh, by the way, the name head, when he says uh, 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 the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. The head of Christ is God. The, the word head refers to simply headship or authority. That's what we're talking about here. The head of every man, of every believer, ultimately every unbeliever as well, is Christ. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Saved, unsaved, every knee will bow. So Christ is authority. The head of woman is man. And this is where I start to get things thrown at me. I hope not from you. 
Now listen, again, my desire is always to speak what the word says, nothing more, nothing less. Not to change it, not to adjust it, to not be offensive to culture. This, when it says here, the head of every woman is man, it's referring to the basic order of creation. That's why he says man, woman comes from man. Why? He's referring back to Adam. Who was made first, Adam or Eve? We know the story goes, Adam was made. And God saw it was not good for him to be by himself. And he was going to make a suitable helper for him. He put him to sleep. And from the man, he created woman. And ever, ever since that time, man has come from woman. But in the original uh, sense, God created man. And from man came the woman. So this is referring to the basic order of creation. It's not declaring all women are under authority of all men. I'm not, I can't come and, and uh, take authority over all the women here, over your wife, okay? Uh, the husband is the authority of a home. Uh, unmarried women, the father is still the authority of the home. This is God's headship principles. This is the authority principle, the accountability that the father is the one who is accountable to God for the home, for what's happening in the home. That's why in the scriptures we read in 1 Timothy describing the role of a, a pastor, the one who shepherds the flock, the bishop, the overseer, the elder. He is to be one who rules his home well. Okay, because he is the one that is in the headship role of the home. So when it says the head of woman is man, it's not just saying every one of you women here are subject to every man that's in this place. No. Yet because of this order, God established man to be the head of the home. And... The established order extends, yes, uh, to the leading, the shepherding of a church. The shepherding of the church, in scripturally speaking, and we'll get more of that later, because Paul has more to say as he's helping the Corinthian church, but the leadership within the church, and yes, this goes against uh, much culture today but the leadership of the church pastoral leadership is is a male role okay and this we can't change because well that's doesn't make sense in today's culture especially in a culture that just seeks to blend the genders god established headship and life will go well when we acknowledge god for his order for his creation, and we celebrate the difference here. The head of Christ is God. Okay. Christ, in his entire ministry, made it clear that he came not to do his own will, but he was subject to the will of the Father. His final prayer in the garden, not my will, but yours be done. It's not about me. He submitted himself to the headship of the Father. So head refers to authority or headship. But that leads us to the second statement. Headship does not infer superiority. We have to understand that. Uh, this is quite apparent as we understand Christ. Although he was the head of Christ is God. He was not in any way inferior to God. Christ uh, is in every way in di di divine qualities equal with God the Father. And this is the Christian understanding, the Christian doctrine, the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. Where there are three distinct persons in the Godhead, but there's one God. And so when Christ came, he was God in carnate, in flesh. He was God with us. And so here we understand and it's clear to see that headship does not mean superiority. 
that in some way Christ was inferior to the Father, and the Father's really the one who's really God. And likewise, when we're talking about headship in the home, it's not about superiority, it's not about inferiority, but it's about headship. God established headship. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 8, Paul writes, For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. Paul explains the order of even creation, as we've already mentioned. Adam was made, and from Adam came the woman. At one point, God saw it was not good for man to be alone. He says, I will make a helper suitable for him. And when God made her from Adam, he brought her to the man. He brought her to him, meaning Adam was head. He presented the woman that he made as a suitable helper for man and said, here, behold, woman. Well, it was Adam that says, you know, this is woman. Or as some scholars have said, whoa, man. Never mind. But the woman was called to share the vision and the agenda of the man. To be that helper that is suitable to him. God gave man a, a work, a role, a function. And the woman was brought in to say, here, you help him in the vision and the goals that I have given to him. Now be aware this idea is offensive to our age. But the Bible teaches us that in the church and in the home, uh, man was made for this position of headship. Anything else, if we're going to take that away, we're going to distort the image, God's intent for the home. And then Paul adds verse 11 Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman. So he focuses on this is not about superiority. It's not about one-upmanship. Neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. But all things are from God. Okay, uh, ever since Adam and Eve, we are dependent on on one another neither is independent of one another uh and in, in, in the natural course of things all of us men we come from women and uh there would be no continuation without one or the other and in the lord um we understand all things are from god so we absolutely paul makes it clear we need each other Realizing the original creation had that particular order. But now, of course, none of us come except through women. But ultimately, all are from God. And then we see we must respond to headship. Our example is Christ. The head of Christ was God. In all things, he submitted himself to the Father. Again, in no way was he inferior. He was, uh, all authority was given to him. All divinity was his. And likewise, men are to be under the authority of Christ. As we lead our homes, women, likewise, are to show submission to the authority of Christ by submitting to the authority of their husbands that God has given their husbands or to the fathers if they are under his authority still this is the headship that God has established thirdly we see God as the designer of the sexes now remember the principles of this passage are eternal but the outworking of these principles may differ from culture to culture. 
As we get into this next section, Paul dives into a couple of issues. He talks about praying and prophesying in the church. He's dealing with the church, the Corinthian church, and he talks about praying and prophesying as men and as women. Verse number four, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. So there's a difference here. There's a difference. Uh, we'll have more to say in future messages in Corinthians on the topic in particular of prophesying. Um, but prophesying ha has many uh, implications. But the majority of the implications of prophesying has to do with the proclamation of the word of God. Proclamation from God. All right. And so, yes, many uh, scholars say preaching of the word of God is, is prophesying. Why? It's not my words, but it's the words that come from God. It's not a new revelation. Not all prophets constantly always just gave new revelation. And the prophets of old would sometimes bring the people back to the word of God. And say, this is what God has said. Listen to God. Listen to him. And so when it comes to praying and prophesying, we see the difference of men and women here. More to say on women as far as authority and as far as teaching and preaching uh, at another message. But what we're talking about here is how this was being done. Whether it be prayer or giving something from the word of God, reading the word of God in a public situation in the church. And I want to be careful <clears throat> not to get too focused just on the head coverings. And I know some church groups, some denominations have been very focused on this and they use this passage. So therefore, all the women you'll find coming into the church are covered with a head covering, a scarf. And maybe you've seen such yourself where they come in with, with a head covering. Some cultures, even some non-Christian cultures in the Middle East in particular, would still continue with this kind of a understanding of the covering of the head of a woman. However, we do see the two categories are doing the same things, but differently. Some suggest the head covered refers to the custom of the day. That is, those who were reputable women outside or inside the church would cover their head. Those disreputable prostitutes, temple prostitutes and the like, did not. And so Paul was saying, no, we sh even though we're free in Christ, and we've talked about our freedom in Christ uh, many times, we are free in Christ, but that is not a good testimony. That is not a good example to set. To be like those of low reputation in our communities, in the church. Others indicate that what Paul was referring to was simply the hair. Uh, women, uh, their head covering is the hair that they possess. Because he does talk about, like in verse 5, every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were sh uh, shaved. And to have a head shaved uh, of a woman at this time, and even now, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a shame. It's something that women don't want. It's a difficult thing. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved. Let her be covered. So from my understanding, from my study, it appears more that the covering was a social norm for women at this time. It was the norm uh, outside and inside the church. And it seems some of the women in the church in Corinth were deciding that they could cast aside the social norm under the pretext that everything is permissible. And we see that phrase used a lot by Paul when he's writing to him. Everything's permissible. But not everything's beneficial. Everything's permissible, but not everything edifies and builds up others. Everything's permissible, but I won't be brought into the power of anything. 
And so he's encouraging them, rethink this. Rethink this. Even if it's permissible, it's a shame. So as I said, let us not focus purely on the prophesying or on the praying. Paul has more to say on that in women later. The main thing I think Paul is urging here is to respect and honor, first, the authority, but second, the sexes that God has made and how he made them. God made male, God made female, he made man and woman, and he made them different, unique, uh, and we need to respect and honor that uniqueness and lift it up and say, thank you, God, for the uniqueness. Women, you need to be able to say, thank you, God, for the uniqueness that you've made me and the femininity that you've given to me. And men, rejoice in your masculinity that God has made you a man and seek to be a godly man, a godly head, a good leader, a loving man. He writes in verse 14, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given to her for a covering. When Paul says, does not nature itself teach you? It's a little unclear as to what he is exactly referring to when he says nature itself. We look out at nature and, uh, you know, at the animal kingdom, uh, you know, we don't always see long fur on animals and short or uh, on female animals and short fur on male animals. So it's not that. In fact, you look at the bird world and the beautiful, colorful birds are often the males, right? And the dull brown ones are the females often in the bird world. So what is Paul talking about? Um, he's referring here, I believe, to the historic norms uh, through the centuries of humanity. The historic norms, the differentiation between men and women. And through culture after culture, it's the women that have the glory of the long hair. And men don't. They don't glory in that. They keep it tidier, shorter, bound up. Um, and as we age, it's very common for the males to lose some of that glory of, on top of their head. Some of you fellas here, I can see you agree with that statement. But it doesn't happen very often among the women, does it? Uh, that's not normal. And it, it, it happens. I'm not saying it's, it doesn't. We live in a you know, fallen world, but it's still not the norm. And it's a shame if it does happen. Not a shame on the woman for letting it happen, but it, it's just a shame that it does happen. Because it's not normal. It's not expected. And so Paul says, doesn't nature itself teach us this very thing. I've known some churches, some Christian groups, which refer to this passage often and then vigorously try to enforce it. Um, the difficulty is sometimes in, in defining short and long. That's the difficulty. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. Okay, what is long? And so they try to come up with some standard of what they define as long. I've seen some that decide, well, if a man's hair actually touches the ears, then it's long. Okay, and that's a shame, and he's, he's sinning. Or if it touches the back of the collar, then it's long. And so that's a shame. So, fellas, feel your hair. Is it touching your ears? Okay, we're going to have a barber in the back after church. To make sure we all comply. And women, you know, women's hair vary quite a bit from style to style. Okay, so what is short style? What is long? So, you know, this is where, you know, some have what I would say tipped into a, a legalistic approach in trying to measure, trying to define this exactly. But I think we're missing the point. 
I think we're not seeing the forest through the trees when we take that approach here. There's another verse that I want us to consider. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. It says, A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man. Amen? Nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. Bong. Sorry. <laughs> I just saw you. I didn't mean anything by it. <laughs> For all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. Okay. And again, some have taken this and used this passage to proclaim, therefore, women must never wear pants. Okay, ladies, you got your trousers on pants? You know, it says, women shall not wear that which pertains to man. I'm wearing pants. And if you're wearing pants, you're wearing my clothes. And it's an abomination to the Lord. But uh, again, I think we're uh, having a problem of culture, of time, of understanding here what it's referring to. Bearing in mind that in ancient Israel, uh, male and female wore some type of robe structures, didn't they? The males didn't go around wearing pants like I am wearing. They wore robes. Jesus wore a robe. The Bible talks about his robe at various places. The women wore robes. We must be careful not to read into and add to the word of God. Yet even among the robes that were worn... There were distinctions between the sexes. I'm not a robe expert. And I can't tell you all the distinctions that ancient Israel had between the sexes. The male robes and the female robes. But they had them. Because they appreciated and understood and celebrated the sexes that God had made. This is womanly. This is masculine. And so the biblical principle that we take here from 1 Corinthians... Um, the Bible doesn't say that hair must not touch the ears. It doesn't say that. Yet surely Paul and the others understood that there were certain characteristics of men's hair, even their hair styles, that were uh, uniquely different than women's. And there should be a distinction. Have you ever come up behind somebody and you thought, oh, that's a nice woman, and then they turn around and you see a guy with a big beard? Um, you know, to me, that's a problem. It shouldn't be like that. I'm not saying it can't touch the ears or it has to be off the collar or whatever, but it, there should be a distinction. And to not have any distinctions, and remember, we're living in a world with 112 different genders who are trying to blur all distinctions and be sexless. And this is, you know, pretty much spitting in the eye of our creator that is the designer that said, this is good. I've made male, I've made female, both of them are in my image. And yes, we acknowledge we're in a fallen world. And, uh, you know, there are examples of, of fallenness. What I mean by that is, is uh, natural examples of difficulties that we're born with. But that's an exception. What God made was male and female. And we celebrate this distinction and this difference. And even in how we appear. So Paul's writing to the uh, Corinthians and saying, you know, nature itself shows us this. Guys, you should look like guys. Okay, however your hairstyle is, if you want to part it this way, that way, in the middle, no part. If you want it a bit longer, a bit shorter, but there's a unique men's style in our culture. And you know what that style is. I'm, I'm speaking as Paul would, is speaking. You know what that style is. You know what it's not. And it's a shame for a man to have long hair. It's a shame for a woman to have short hair. If you can't tell a woman and the glory of her hair that's unique, that celebrates the difference, and that's not good either.
God is not the author of confusion. God created order. And we see in this passage a reminder to us of the order, of the authority, of the headship. God's word doesn't change. Culture does change. Cultural things come and go. But the principle of headship, the principle of the sexes, still must remain. Both sexes are unique. And both are distinct from one another. There's many similarities. It's not about superiority. Um, but we can see the differences. We can appreciate the differences and celebrate those differences. Remember, God's word never changes. Praise God for that. Never changes. Culture may change. Ideas come and go, but God's word does not. Remember that God is the one who established authority. Authority in the home, his method uh, and approach of authority, even within the church in leading it. The authority of the home is the husband. God established men to shepherd and lead in the church environment, not taking over authority from the home. Jesus willingly submitted to the Father, though he was equal in every way. But he submitted to that authority, that headship. And finally, remember, God designed the sexes. So men, be godly men. Be proud of your masculinity. And women, I urge you to embrace biblical femininity. Femininity. Embrace it. Celebrate it. May God bless you in this. Would you stand with me? With every head bowed and eye closed, I, I just want to take time to submit ourselves to the Lord first. And if, if you're here right now and you're scratching your head... Maybe some things rubbed you wrong. Um, I just want to encourage you to at least ask yourself the question, does it seem that way because of the influence that culture has had in your life? What does the Word of God actually say and teach about these things? And so I would encourage you to dive into the word more, examine these things, and be willing to submit yourself to God's word. We must always be willing to do that. Women, God created you wonderfully. Uh, we need women. We need godly Women who appreciate and celebrate how God has made them. Who acknowledge and submit to the authority of the home. Not as an inferior being. Just like Jesus was in no way inferior to the, the Father. But as one who acknowledges God's headship. If our homes had more of this understanding, I believe there would be more harmony and peace in the home. More in the home. Men, take your responsibility and role as a man that God has made you. Never apologize to be a man. But be proud of that masculinity. God made us in his image. He's made us uniquely. And uh, take up that mantle. Be heads of the home. Loving heads. Ephesians reminds us, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. 
We can't ignore that part. You can't take the headship part and beat your wife over the head with it without taking the love your wives as Christ loved the church part. If we do that, our wives would gladly submit to our headship. Let us take a moment to say thank you, Lord, for making us as he has. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your creation. You made us in your image, male and female. But yet, Lord, we understand and we want to appreciate and acknowledge how you made us. We acknowledge headship, that Christ is the head of every man. Every knee will bow to him. We acknowledge, Lord, that... um, The husband, the man, is the head of the home. We acknowledge, Lord, that um, that Christ was uh, under subjection to the Father and under His will. Lord, we thank You for this headship. And we also celebrate the sexes and the differences. And may we, Lord, always view our culture through biblical glasses seeing things from your word, your point of view, as we learn of these things, as we shape our opinions, our foundation, may it be built on the word of God, not on anything else outside. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take a seat. We have a couple announcements. Thank you for the message this morning. Just a few quick announcements before we're dismissed. Mm. So the Christmas portrait's coming up just immediately after the service. Uh, Gigi, no. Who's, you're doing the portraits. Come on up here. Tell us about the Christmas program as well because it's the second announcement, right? Is that you or is that Chandra? Is this on? Do I even need a mic? Yeah. I'm going to act like I know what I'm doing, but I don't. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Okay, thank you, everybody. So today is the IBC Family Portrait Photo Shoot. Yay! Come on, let's all, we're all excited, right? Yay! We praise the Lord for providing a photographer today. Thank you, Lord, for that. Now, we have the list, okay? in order of who, if it's your turn, and all that. Now, we have posted them on the walls outside. The main worship hall will be the waiting area. I will be calling on the families in order of the, the sign-up sheet. Okay, if it's your turn, I will let you know. I will also let you know if you're on standby, if you're next. Now, there will be, I think, a few life groups will have their photo session too. Please check with your life group leader if you're going to have one or not and what time it will be. There is also an IBC leadership team, uh, I think, at 12 o'clock, so please stay for that. And another announcement is for the program, okay, we have a practice at 4 p.m. today, so please, we'll we'll see you later at 4 o'clock. Any questions about the sign-up sheet, okay? So please just... Wait for me to call you, and this will be our waiting area. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Gigi. And then also we have the teen group, or the uh, Elevate Youth Camp. Elevate Youth Camp at Lake Talpa. We have some brochures for that. So if you didn't get a brochure, or you would like to have one of the brochures, just see Josh and Denise. They'll have these in the back. And then if you haven't signed up but you intend to sign up, you can still do that. Just get your registration form again from Josh and Denise. The prison ministry with the chocolate bars, we're nearly there. One more week we can collect the chocolate bars, and then we'll be taking them and putting them in the gift bags. So if you intend to bring one of the chocolate bars, be sure and look at the, uh, the parameters by which the chocolate bars have to be. We have to have the same size, the same kind for each of the gift bags, and then you can bring that next Sunday. And that'll be our cutoff date for the chocolate bars for the prison ministry. Continue to pray for our missionaries, Pastor Cliff and his wife, Shannon. Cliff and Shannon Wadsworth, our missionaries here in New Zealand, South Auckland. 
as well. And then each of our missionary letters that are new for the past week, we've posted in the back so you can see that also. Now, maybe you're celebrating a birthday or a wedding anniversary, and we'd like to celebrate that with you. Anyone with a birthday this coming week? Anyone with a birthday? Come on up here, Penny. David. David, come up. Come up, Santo. Anyone else with a birthday? How about wedding anniversaries? Do we have anyone with wedding anniversaries this week? No wedding anniversaries? No other birthdays? Let's all stand together. We're going to sing happy birthday, and then we'll be dismissed in prayer. Let's all sing happy birthday. Thank you all for coming. May the Lord bless you. May you go out this place today and be a light, be the salt of the earth, be the testimony that God wants you to be in our world that needs him. Thank you, Lord, for your uh, word to us today. May you continue to work in your people. Build us, Lord, into the kind of church that you envisioned, that you had in mind. In Jesus' name. And we say, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.